All right, let us get into it. This is my Bible. It is Yah's Word. It is the inspired, infallible Word of Yah. It is a lamp unto my feet. Blessed are those who hear the Word of Yah and keep it. I find out who I am in the page contained herein. This is my Bible. Hope everyone is doing well this morning. Doing well as well. So today's message will be a little different. Don't worry. It's not one of the controversial ones. It's going to be one of our... one. Uh, like to do some obscure stories because there's so many things that we can learn and it's things that we haven't been taught before. But we have the scripture because the Most High has given us instructions. He has given us commandments. He has given us his Torah. Does anybody remember what the word Torah means? I'll go do the sermon I did last time, right over since it's not sticking. It means instructions. Oh yeah, great answer in the back of the class. Let's look at Proverbs 28, verse 9, before we get into our obscure story. And this is out of uh, the King Jimmy. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. Now, what word in Hebrew do you think is here when it says the law? Torah, there you go, you're catching on. So if we turn the deaf ear, in the NIV, it says instructions. So if we turn a deaf ear to his instructions, to his commands, to his law, Scripture says, not Darren, so this isn't me being controversial at all, because the Bible says, if we turn away from it, our prayers are detestable, this is what the word they use in the NIV. King James says abomination. And we wonder why some of our prayers don't get answered. And what did he say? You that want a good life, follow the commands. Again, I didn't say it. So let's look at an overused scripture that everybody loves to use. And they use it in non-biblical context. But they don't even finish the verse. Now, I know that it's a problem when we take verses out of context, but you don't, people don't even finish the verse where this scripture is used. Hosea chapter four, verse six. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. We all, everybody loves to say that one. But let's keep going because everybody stops there. Because... You have rejected knowledge. I also reject you as my as my priest because you have ignored the law, the Torah of your God. I also will ignore your children because everything that we do as parents is a ripple effect with our children. So the small ripple effect we do in our lives can be a tidal wave. In our children's lives. You see the difference between a ripple. And a tidal wave. So he's saying. I'm, you ignored. What I gave you. I know where it's going to hurt. I'm going to ignore your children. Maybe even. This is gospel according to Darren. I'll ignore your prayers. About your children. And for your children. Now, what is, what did they reject? Knowledge. Again, if you, you can research this on your own, if you look at what word is used there, just guess what word you think is used. Torah. All right. So he didn't change his mind because he said, he, does, he said, I don't change, right? right. And some of y'all with that new age Christianity, you're like, well, God changed after Jesus and he became a more gentle God. The reason why we don't have the examples of God the Father's character is because the New Testament takes place over a short period of time. 
Like, it's not thousands of years like the Old Testament is. Like, if you think about the New Testament, the books that we have from, from Matthew to Revelation, it's not a long period of time. It's the birth of Jesus, and then it ends with John being uh, uh, exiled on an island. John, who was alive at the same time as Jesus. So it's in a natural lifetime. In the Old Testament, you know all them genealogies they have? There's generations. And the New Testament is just one. So he didn't change. And Jesus multiple times, Paul multiple times said, hey, he gave us this. He gave us these instructions. We should follow them. When Paul was on trial for, not fo- for teaching people not to follow the law, there was no evidence that was found. But today in, in American Christianity, we say all the time, Paul said we don't got to do that. Paul himself said, hey, hey, I know what y'all trying to do, but there's no evidence. I agree with every single letter of the laws, literally what he said under oath. So the Torah, the writings of the prophets, the gospels, and the writings of Paul are great instructions for us to follow. I don't want to be accused of being Old Testament only. All of it is good, and all of it is good examples and teachings and instructions for us to follow. Anyone care to disagree? Nope. But the Torah is the foundation of it all. Another cliche Bible verse everyone uh, loves to use is, everything is beneficial, but not everything is permissible. Mm-hmm. Now that one young charismatic pastor that I'm always telling you guys about, He did a study a year ago and told you that Paul is saying, when you look at it in the original, what he wrote it in, he said everything is lawful, everything that's in the law is good, but not everything is permissible. He's saying, with these books that Moses gave us, we have examples of what to do and what not to do. Like, don't sleep with your maid. (laughs) Even if your wife told you to do it. <laughs> like, that's what it is. Like, because not everything in there in the Torah is good. It's, it's beneficial. It's beneficial for us to know, but it's not permissible for us to do. So today, I want us to look at a story from Scripture. It's an obscure story, but I guarantee that you will obtain something from it. You will learn from it. You will not have lack of knowledge from it. But I need to set up all the characters. Because this story takes place, you know, to use a sports metaphor, and I try not to do too many sports metaphors, but we have a sport game that people are going to watch today for the commercials, myself included. My team, I I tried so hard not to be rude for the team. Then they kept winning. And I'm like, I'm not going to fall for it. I'm not going to fall for it. I'm not going to fall for it. And then I fell for it. And what do they do when I fell for it? The one time, I'm like, oh, they can win this game. Every other time, I'm like, they're going to lose. They're going to lose. They're going to lose. One time, I'm like, they might win. And I had a relapse in judgment. I had lack of knowledge. I had lack of knowledge. As Pastor would say, because he said, I've been rooting for this team for X amount of years. And they'll let you down every year. But I'm like, no, this, look, it's different. It's magical. <laughs> It'll be a great story. It'll be the same story. Amen. <laughs> but I have to give some backstory for these because this story that we're reading about today takes place in the fourth quarter of the game. But I need to let you know what team everybody is, what the players are. So I have to go and do some backstory. We have to do some research, and it's going to be a lot. So we got to stop scrolling on Facebook and Instagram. We actually have to pay attention because you're not going to get it at the end because my sermon is just one chapter in the the book. But you won't get it because you won't know who any of these people are or the context of them. So are we ready? So the issue at hand will be tangible. So we need to learn who the main characters are. So the first character is King Saul. Not Saul, who who's also known as Paul, but Old Testament King Saul. Saul is appointed by Samuel to be Israel's first what? King. 
I gave you the I gave you the the answer and the question. First human king, correct? Because y'all told Samuel they reject. They're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me as their king because the Israelites, our ancestors, were so foolish. They were winning and beating, conquering everybody. They were at the top, and they said, "We want a king like the other nations." Now, King Saul is a great warrior king. He's got a lot of bodies. Bodies, bodies, bodies. He's, he's, he's got a, a long list of names that he's done killed. He goes into a fight. He comes out on top. But Saul, as most men with egos, which means all men, right. calm down. <laughs> Saul starts to feel himself a little bit. You know, for the few brothers we have in here, like Saul, every day Saul got a fresh haircut. That's how Saul walked around all the time. Like, oh, let me, I gotta, I gotta post this. That's how Saul, after he started to get all these wins, that's how he felt every day. He's like, I'm the anointed one. I'm who I'm chosen. I, I can do anything I want. And Samuel is late one day, and Samuel is the priest, and Saul does Samuel's job. Let's refresh our memory a bit, because Saul is a king, he is not a priest. So let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 13, 13 to 14. So this is right after Saul has done what he's not supposed to do. He acted as a priest, but he was not one. And then Samuel comes onto the scene and says, you have done a foolish thing. You have not kept the command uh, Yahuwah your Elohim gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. If you had just listened, if you didn't reject knowledge, <clears throat> he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all, for all time. Verse 14. But now your kingdom will not endure. Yah has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept Yah's command. Now, what kind of person did Samuel say that Yah is seeking? A man after his own heart. A man after his own heart. A better translation, a man whose heart is just like mine. We enter our next character, and we all know King David. There you go with young, ruddy, light-skinned, handsome David. Because that's what the word ruddy means. We, uh, that young charismatic pastor did a message on that. And how ruddy means dirt mixed with blood. What kind of color would you get after that? Like a brown. Not, not, a, <laughs> not an Englishman. <laughs> now, young, handsome David, he starts out playing the harp for Saul when he was losing his mind. Then he slays Goliath. And again, as Pastor points out all the time, Goliath was calling out Saul. He's like, I heard y'all got somebody out there. Bring them, come on down here. Let's go one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> Run that fade real quick. <laughs> then he becomes part of Saul's army because David was not a warrior before he had practice in the field. As he said, he said, Goliath is just a big bear. I done slayed giants before. But he becomes part of Saul's army. Now, if you can remember from a few seconds ago, what does Saul have a reputation for? There's going to be a lot of questions today. None of them are rhetorical. What did Saul have a reputation for? Because why did Goliath want to call him out? He was a warrior. He was a warrior. He was a fighter. He had bodies. He was great at it. Mm -hmm. Some of y'all should read your Bibles. Not just Sunday and Wednesday. But now, so Saul has a reputation of killing people. Let's just call it what it is. But now, David is getting a reputation for killing people. And his reputation is exceeding 
Saul's. So let's look. I'm not making this up. 1 Samuel chapter 18, 5 through 11. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. Verse 7. As they dance, they sing, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. So Saul's doing it, but David's really doing it. Saul's all right, but David's that guy. Verse 8. Oh, thank you. Oh, I was going a lot. <laughs> All right. Getting spoiler alerts there. <laughs> Verse 8. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought. But me, only thousands. <laughs> like, I've murdered a whole bunch of people, but I'm, I'm mad that my body count's not as high as David's body count. Well, we talked about that ego. What more can he get but the kingdom? He's coming from my spot. And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. So we have these people singing a song. It angers Saul. And he's like, I got to keep my eye on him. And let's see what happens. Verse 10. The next day. Say the next day. So Saul's getting in his feelings and he's going against who Yah has picked. He's going against the command because again, jealousy, envy, all these different things that are against the command. What happens to them the very next day? The next day, an evil spirit from Yah came forcefully on Saul. So I don't haven't we've gone through the story. I haven't mentioned the devil yet, right? But Saul has opened this door because of his issues, right? He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the lyre, as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand, verse 11, and he hurled it saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. I'm going to kill him right now. Because yesterday, them chicks were singing about him. Especially because it was the women that were saying it. It was cheering them on in the crowd. Because again, y'all know how dudes play differently when they women are around. So all of this started from Samuel's words from saying, you're not going to have it anymore. It's going to be a dude whose heart is like the most highs. And then the crowd singing a song. And look how things have changed for Saul. The words from other people have caused people that were totally fine together to have problems. Think about the friendships you've lost just because of the words of other people. Not something that they did, not something that you did, but the words from other people. I'm glad I'm not the only one. And then you add in Saul's ego. So we need to figure out one more character that is important to the story. Our last main character is Jonathan. Jonathan is King Saul's son. So we have Saul, the first human king of Israel, David, who we all know as King David, and then Saul has a son, his oldest son, Jonathan. Jonathan takes after his father. 1 Samuel chapter 13, 1 through 4. Saul was 30, year old, 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel 42 years. Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel, 
Two thousand were with him at Michmash and in the hill country of Bethel, and a thousand were with Jonathan at Gilbia and Benjamin. The rest of the men he sent back to their homes. Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost at Geba, and the Philistines heard about it. Then Saul had the trumpet blown throughout the land and said, Let the Hebrews hear. So all Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost, and now Israel has become obnoxious to the Philistines. And the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. So now this story, so we have Saul's son, Jonathan, who's a, war, a fighter as well. Can we get, understand that? This story ends that I just told. This story ends with Saul being rebuked by Samuel. This is the battle where Saul does what he wasn't supposed to do. Where Jonathan starting the fight. So Jonathan is on site. Now David and Samuel, before all of this happens, they're super tight, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to look at a few scriptures. 1 Samuel 18, 1 through 4. But because we know Saul does not has a problem with David now. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Now, so Jonathan loves David. That's my guy. Now, this verse, people will use to say that, John, that David and Jonathan were in a sexual relationship. I do not subscribe to this because the author here is very explicit when it comes to David and would not leave this detail out. Why would he go over all the things David has done wrong and all the things David has done right? He goes like every single thing David does, the author communicates. Why would he leave that detail out? And this is not to slander against our LGBT brothers and sisters. I just think that if they were in an actual relationship... It will be mentioned just like everything else David did. So let's continue with how tight Jonathan and David were. So we know that Saul is trying to kill David, right? He just hurled a spear at him, right? So let's see how Jonathan reacts and acts. 1 Samuel 19, 1 through 10. Saul told his son Jonathan and all his attendants to kill David. So he knows that his, Jonathan is tight with David. He said, you need to kill him. But Jonathan had taken a great liking to David and warned him, my father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. I'll speak to him about you and will tell you what I find out. So he's like, I'll get the tea. I'll let you know. Verse 4. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, let not the king... Do wrong to his servant David. He is David. He has not wronged you. So again, Saul is doing all of this because nothing that David has done. That is a key part. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory over all Israel, and you saw it and were glad. Why then would you want to do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? Verse 6, Saul listened to Jonathan and took this oath. As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. So Jonathan called David and told him the whole conversation. He texted him first. He brought him, to, he brought him to Saul and David was with Saul as before. So Jonathan thinks he's got it all squared away. He's trying to stop the beat between David and say, um, Saul. Are we following still? I know it's a lot. Verse 9, oh wait, no, sorry. Verse 8. Once more war broke out, and David went out and fought the Philistines. He struck them with such force that they fled before him. But an evil spirit from Yah came on Saul as he was sitting in the house with the spear in his hand. While David was playing the lyre, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with the spear. But David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. That night, David made good his escape. So Jonathan now 
that he sees his dad's tripping again. Jonathan confronts Saul, his father, on David's behalf. Chapter 20. Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan and he said to him, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman. <laughs> like, but you chose her. <laughs> like, I, would, I had nothing to do with that. Like, you was the one that tried to holler at her. <laughs> Don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse, that was David's name, for if you didn't know, to your own shame and to the shame of the mother who bore you, keeps bringing up my mom. Like, relax. <laughs> Verse 31. As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him to me, for he must die. So this is kind of prophetic by what Saul said, because he said, if David's alive, Jonathan, you'll never be a king. This is coming come into play. A little spoiler alert warning. Verse 32. Why should he be put to death? What has he done? It was just some girl singing a song. Chill out. <laughs> Verse 33, but Saul hurled his spear at him to kill him. Then Jonathan knew that his father intended to kill David. Saul was quick to launch his spear at people. Like people should just say, you can't come in the room with that. Like leave that at the door. We're going to have a conversation because he's quick to throw this spear at somebody. Now in 1 Samuel chapter 23, Jonathan pledges his allegiance to David's future kingdom over his own father's. We are going somewhere with this. I know it's a lot, but I, I, tr I trust me that my actual sermon that I get to is going to be good. Right. Now, David and Saul have so many other run-ins, but that's not the point of the story. My grandmother used to always tell this story about when Sam, uh, Saul was in a cave using the bathroom and David was in there and he could have killed him, but he didn't. And then he showed him later, like, hey, I could have killed you. Because David doesn't want to kill Saul. Because David's like, bro, I thought we was cool. Right. Have you ever had that person that starts being mean and disrespectful and aggressive towards you? He's like, yo, we were friends last week. Right. Like, what, what happened? Right. But again, somebody said something. Right. So later on, Saul and Jonathan die. Let's go to 1 Samuel 31, 1 through 4. Now the Philistines fought against Israel. The Israelites fled before them and many fell dead on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines were in hot pursuit of Saul and his sons, and they killed his sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malkishua. Verse 3. The fighting grew fierce around Saul, and when his arch the archers overtook him, they wounded him critically. Saul so said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and run me through or these uncircumcised fellows will come and run me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer was terrified and would not do it, so T Saul took his own sword and fell on it. For extra credit points, does anybody know who else died like this in the Bible? Judas, Judas the disciple that betrayed Jesus. All right. What are we credit? Two points. <laughs> <laughs> so David's enemy by his own doing, and David's BFF have died. So let us get to the story that we need to get to because people are loyal to Saul. He's the first human king. He was, so in 2 Samuel chapter 1, David hears about the death of Saul and Jonathan. David is so angry that he has his men kill the person that brought the news. He said, why didn't you help him? He's like, bro, he was dying. Like, I, I can't. I'm not, I can't do miracles. <laughs> David still had love for Saul even after all his wrongdoing. This is for somebody in here. David knew that Saul wasn't his enemy, but it was the spirit that was inside of him. It was the spirit that was influencing him. It was the spirit that forcibly came upon him. Because remember, Saul was cool for a minute. And then it says the spirit, the evil spirit came back and took over. So David knew like that's not Saul. Some of us need to understand that. But I am not in no way saying 
to keep hanging out with the person that keeps throwing spears at you. <laughs> because what did David do? He fled. He loved Saul for who he was, but not what that influence had over him. Not what that influence had him doing afterwards. When he when Saul was under the influence. <clears throat> David loved Saul so much that he had the tribe of Judah learn a song of sorrow for Saul and Jonathan. Now David then becomes king. But he is at war with the remnant of Saul's children and Saul's followers. In 2 Samuel chapter 2, one of Saul's sons and Saul's loyal subjects in general have a fist fight to the death with David and his men. They said, put down swords, let's run it. <laughs> but David and his men are victorious. David is killing off all the remnant of those loyal to Saul. The battle between the two kingdoms went on for a while. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. The war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. David grew stronger and stronger, while the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Again, going somewhere with this. But again, these are people that David loved. Sometimes we're going to be in a fight with people that we love because of that spirit, that influence forcibly coming upon them. And they are only at war. How did this all start? Because of the words of someone else. Because Samuel told him what was going to happen, and then the girls had a song. That was the start of it all. Like, people, y'all be wanting to read the New Testament all the time. The drama and the tea is in the Old Testament. <laughs> like, literally, Samuel said, dude, you're dumb. Why did you do that? Someone else is going to take over. And then these girls is like, Saul's cool, but David's the, the guy. And he's throwing spears at people now. But Jonathan... Jonathan had a son. Everyone that is a part of the remnant of Saul are scared and they go into hiding because of how powerful and how successful David is when it comes to the hands. So 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4. Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. This happened because he was five years old and the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, his nurse. So they're telling the origin story here. So Jonathan's son. Everybody heard. Jonathan and Saul are dead. His nurse picked him up to flee. But as she hurried to leave, he fell. So she falls, drops him. He's disabled. He's paralyzed. He can't walk. His name was Mephibosheth. We're going to call him Phoebo for short. Because I'm now about to get tongue-tied with that for the rest of the time. So Phoebo, his legs don't work because of an injury when they were fleeing in fear. Because they didn't have the sort of medical advancements we have now. Even 200 years ago, people would die for things that people catch all the time now. Because they didn't have the technology to do it. So later in chapter 4, there's a story of two of Saul's hitmen. And one of them is killed in his bed while he slept. So it's one of Saul's people are killed in his bed. We got that? Mm -hmm. Then they come and tell David that they killed this guy in his bed. Like, yeah, we got another one of Saul's homeboys. Caught him, caught him slipping and sleeping. <laughs> David said, do you know what I did to the messenger that told me that Saul was dead? Like, ask about me. I had him killed. What do you think I'm going to do to someone that killed someone in their own home, in their own bed? Again, David doesn't want these problems. But he's definitely about that life. 
Then David becomes king over all of Israel. So are we good? All of that was to set up my actual sermon. So we're at the beginning part now. You don't have to react like Kristen when she was a child and say, oh man, it's about to be long. It's a short sermon. But this was just the setup. <laughs> All of that was the setup, this last verse. But we needed to understand who these characters were and what their history was with one another. Can't turn on a movie with five minutes to go and expect to get anything from it, right? Yeah. All right they have a sip from our sponsor before we finish. 2 Samuel chapter 9. So this is when all these people have been killed. David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? Yeah. Verse 3. David asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show Yah's kindness? <coughs> Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. He can't walk. Where is he? David asked. Ziba answered, he is at the house of Makir, son of Amiel in, Lodab in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. When Phebo, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed to pay him honor. David said, Phebo, at your service, Phebo replied, don't be afraid, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Phoebe bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Verse 9. Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. Verse 10. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for and Phoebo, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants, so he was, he was out there. <laughs> Verse 11. Then Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Phoebo ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Verse 12. Mephibosheth had his young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. See... You may be going through something right now. You might have the same disposition as our friend Phoebo. You may view yourself in your current predicament as a dead dog. But the king, and somebody needs to hear this, but the king, the king of kings, sees you as worthy as being one like the son of the king. The king said he has a place prepared for you at his table because there's a time when Jesus says to the disciples, I no longer call you servants, which means previously, what did he call them? Because he said, I can't previously do it because he must have said it before. They called him master. Masters have servants. But he elevated and adopted us in when he said, this is how you pray. Our father. Not mine. Every time before he said, my father knows the way. My father, my father, my father. But then he's like, our father. So we might have some times where we're going through some suffering. We're spiritually lame in both legs. 
We feel like we can't move without assistance. But the king says, you can eat at my table. I've prepared a place for you. Yes. You can sit here. You don't have to live in fear anymore. And then when you least expect it, because Mephibosheth was not thinking about, oh, I can't wait for David to call me and give me something nice and to change my life and to change my family's life. But that's what our king does. He changes our lineage. He changes our generations. The king of kings will show you kindness, will show you mercy, and will provide you a blessing. Thank you, Father, for adding the blessing to the reading of the word.